Very, very sweet song, Robin. Thank you. Uh, anybody in here want something new? <laughs> Few of us. You know, the thing is, you know, in order to accept something new, what do you have to do? Let go of something old. We got this theme, right? Let go, let God, let God, let go. We have to let go in order to receive, some, to receive something new. Dang, we don't like that part, right? But every time we receive something new, we receive a whole new consciousness. Or potentially, we can. We can open ourselves up to a whole new way of being. And every time we open ourselves up to a whole new way of being, which, by the way, isn't a one-time deal, right? It's moment by moment by moment by hour by hour by day by day by week by month by year. It's an ongoing process. But every time that we open, we can receive more, receive more good, more love, more harmony, more peace, more life, and more God. So the question for today is, what is God calling you to do or to be, to stretch? What is that thing that's up for you that God is calling you into? Just think about it for a moment. You don't have to answer out loud. It's okay. You can keep it personal, quiet. That's supposed to be funny. (laughs) Did God ever ask you to do anything that seems too big? Too hard, too much. No, uh, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that, right? Ever? Anybody? A uh, couple, uh, mostly right down here, right? right? <laughs> We've all had those moments where we say to God, You want me to do what? First service people were here. <laughs> you want me to do what? All together now. You want me to do what? So think about that thing that God's calling you. You want me to do what? We've got congregation members who are, you know, having uh, pretty major health challenges. Some are in the hospital. Some have gone through surgery. Some are having relationship or financial challenges. And yet what we find in the midst of that in our spiritual journey is that there is a calling. We're being called up. We're being called on our spiritual journey to a greater consciousness, a greater understanding, a greater awareness of God in the midst. So there was a man, and he was walking on a beach. Somebody said, I look like Hawaii. I said, I had been wanting the beach, so we had to go to the beach today, at least in the story, right? And the man walking along the beach stumbled across something, and it was a lantern, a lamp. And what do we do? What do we do when we find a lantern in front of our feet, right? What do we do? We pick it up because we've all had this experience, whether we know it or not, and we rub the lantern. So when we rub the lantern, a genie appears. So a genie appears to this man on the beach. And the genie says, wow, you know, I've been here a really, really, really long time and my magic's a little uh, rusty. So I'm not going to give you three wishes, just one. (laughs) One? Yeah, what? One wish. What do you want? What do you want? More than anything, I can't grant you any wish you want, anything you want. And the man goes, oh, I know exactly what I want. I wish I had a, a, a highway from where I live right here in San Francisco all the way in Hawaii, and I was just fast speed. I could just drive over there a piece of cake easy. Sounds good. The genie goes, wow, that's a lot. That would be pretty tough. Well, why don't, don't you have something else? Let, let, come up with another one. Give me, a, give, me, give, give me another try. That's like too big, right? And the man goes, well, actually, there's one other thing that I would really like. I've always wanted this. It's... it's um, he goes, okay, give it to me. He goes, oh, I just want to understand my wife. I just want to get inside her head and understand what she thinks and how she operates in that mind of hers. And the genie goes, how many lanes did you want that highway? <laughs> you want me to do what? So we are in our Mountaintop Experience series. Last week, uh, Rob introduced it, and Mountaintop 
is really what we're using and really what was used in Scripture as that higher spiritual place. You know, every time that we get to a mountaintop, we have or potentially have a spiritual experience. Every time we have a spiritual experience, we can call that a mountaintop. So we talked about last week the layers, the steps, the plateaus about getting there. But always when we have a mountaintop experience, it changes our consciousness. But it's not always an easy journey. Yes? From experience? Yes. So we talked about uh, the burning bush and Moses last week. Today we go to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the place where Abraham, Abraham said to God, you want me to do what? It's the place, supposedly, based on research, one of the places that, that they say that, that the uh, crucifixion was held. Jesus was crucified real close to the Mount, Mount Moriah. It's the place where Solomon built the temple. So, you know, we think mountains. I grew up in Colorado. I think mountains. I think mountains, right? Right? I lived at 9,000 feet for a while, and that was the base of the mountain. So I think mountains. So I thought, well, I'm going to look up Mount Moriah because what we know is the temple's built on Mount Moriah. It doesn't look like a mountain to me. Does it look like a mountain to you? Well, here's what it says. It wasn't exactly a mount, but it was a series of ridges, and it was, all, it was 771 meters. That's like 2,400 feet. Now, I'm from Colorado, right? 2,400 feet, that's not even a speed bump. <laughs> but as we're growing in our mountaintop experiences, some of our mountains feel like speed bumps and some of our speed bumps feel like mountains, okay? So it's a mount. We're calling it a mount. It's one of the mounts. So Mount Moriah metaphysically means this. The land of Moriah, to which Abraham was told to go and make his sacrifice, when changes take place in the consciousness, there are sometimes some very bitter experiences, and a stout faith is needed to believe that good will come out of them. But good always comes. Good always comes if there's a steadfast obedience and faith in the goodness of God. Think about that thing you're faced with. Think about that thing that seems too big in your life right now. Great power in spirit and in body grows out of this steadfast overcoming, this giving up of the old and entering into the new. That's called the spiritual journey. Isaac who represents the Christ or the new birth in individual consciousness was restored and Abraham became the father of the multitudes, which means basically that when you are firmly standing in your faith, when your faith is firm in your entire consciousness, faith in the higher good, the multitude of truth ideals come to one until our whole consciousness and life are transformed. So we had faith as our daily word, and Abraham represents faith. Abraham was the first patriarch in the Old Testament. Abraham was called by God to leave his homeland. And God made a covenant with Abraham. He said, if, if you leave this home and go unto this new land, then I will make you the father of many nations. You remember those stories? I will make you a father. I will bless you and your offspring and your nations if you will go and do this. So Abraham was a follower of God. Abraham was developing faith. Abraham went into a new land. There's lots and lots of stories in the book of Genesis about Abraham. In fact, he goes about 10 chapters. But in the 22nd chapter, well, no, before that, let's go back a little bit. Abraham now was an old man. Abraham was approaching 100 years old, and he has another conversation with God. And God says, if you do this, I will bless you with many offspring and great nations. I will give you multitudes upon multitudes. And, and Abraham says, I'm a hundred years old. I don't have any kids. I don't expect to now. And my wife, by the way, is 90. 
90. Okay, now we can imagine some of us in this room always wanted children, right? And then we get beyond our childbearing years and we're really grateful, right? <laughs> right? Right? Can you imagine being 90 and still wanting to birth a child? No. No. So the angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham and Sarah was in the tent and, the, and he said, no, really. Really, within the year, I'll come back in a year, within the year, and child will, Sarah will have birthed a child. Well, Abraham laughed. Ha, <laughs> yeah, right. I've been waiting all these years, and now, and Sarah laughed because she overheard it, and she laughed. And then a year later, this baby boy, Isaac, was born. They were close to 100 years old. Think about that, waiting for that child for 100 years. Well, okay, 60, 70, 80 years waiting for that child, right? And Isaac is predicted to be then the father of many nations, just as Abraham was. So then we jump ahead to the 22nd chapter. And Isaac is, he has now been weaned. Okay, so that makes him what, two, three, four years old, right? Thinking. And then we have this chapter I'm going to talk about. And then the next chapter, Sarah dies at 127 years old. So he's somewhere between 2 and 37, Isaac is. Somewhere right there, right there. But if they're 100, I guess that's, I mean, that makes sense, right? Because that's a long time. So I'm going to read you parts of this chapter of Genesis 22. After the, all these things, God tested Abraham. Abraham, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. You want me to do what? Okay, it's call and response today. <laughs> Together? You want me to do what? But Abraham rose up early one morning and he went. Abraham didn't say, you want me to do what? That's us, right? And um, they found the place and he gave Isaac the wood of the burnt offering. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So, you know, in the movies that we watch, the Ten Commandments and such, Isaac is about, what, eight, nine, ten, maybe 12 years old. So that makes more sense. When you go two, it doesn't work. When you go 37, it doesn't work. So we're going to go with, you know, that age, okay? So the two of them walked on together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, here I am, my son. And Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Isaac said, hmm. God himself will provide the lamb for burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Okay. All right. And they came to the place that God had shown him. Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. Then he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. What? And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. And as that knife was coming down, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he stopped. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram. And he went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So what's the metaphysics of this? The metaphysics is as we are deepening our faith, as we are deepening and awakening to a greater awareness of that presence and that power that is God, we are called to do many things. We are called to sacrifice that which is most dear to us. Well, sacrifice is an interesting word. It's not one we like in unity, right? It's kind of like sin and blood and things like that. 
Sacrifice, however, metaphysically means a refining process that is constantly going on in consciousness. It's the renunciation of old beliefs that seem good for new ideas that are more the nature of Christ. It's the same. It's letting go of the old. It's the renunciation of the old for something that is greater. It's also just simply practice spiritual practice. So when you read the word sacrifice, if you can translate and substitute the word practice, I'm in spiritual practice here. And so we're called to do these mighty things. We're called to do these things that make absolutely no sense to what? Our logic, our intellect, our personality, our smallness in the great grand scheme of God. And yet in this case of Abraham and Isaac, it was his willingness to do whatever it took And in that willingness, he was freed from the actual act. But it's that willingness. What are you being called to do? What is God calling you to do? What what are those places in you that you feel them? You feel them bubbling up. They're not usually overnight. They're, They're there for a while. You know, sometimes it's that conversation you need to have or that, you know, that thing that needs to be looked at that you know isn't really working. But if we are on a spiritual journey when I believe we are, and I believe that you are because you're in this room today. Our work on this planet is to awaken. Now, we got it confused sometimes. Somewhere along the line, we decided that our work here on the planet was to have perfect lives with everything we want. We, many of us still want that. And it's not that you can't have it, but that's not the focus of our life on this planet. Our focus, our purpose for being on this planet is to awaken is to come to remember that we are one with God. But that's not a remembering that's intellectual. It is an experience of growth and letting go and change and something new and letting go again and growth and opening and opening consciousness and coming to find that God is in the very midst of all of it. A few, well, quite a few years ago, I was called into ministry, obviously. And and I remember the first time I got a call to ministry. It was a number of years before I actually got into seminary, probably like even seven or eight, quite quite a while. And and at that time, I was um, very, very quiet. I was very, very shy. I was definitely the wallflower. You wouldn't even know I was in the room. I know it's hard to imagine, but just (laughs) use that power of imagination. I did not speak in public. I mean, even in a class, you know, a class of, you know, 12 or 15 or 20 people, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak. It just, I just didn't do it. It just was not in me. (laughs) And I had a time in my life where I kind of, you know, I had a moment I was, you know, hit my knees and like, okay, God, whatever, you know, I obviously can't run my life. I've made another mess and I don't know how to get out of it. So I surrender. And I made a covenant with God in that moment. I said, okay, I will do whatever you show me is next. I will walk through the next door. That's all I know how to do. And it wasn't but a minute, certainly within a year of that moment, that I got the call to come into ministry. And I said together, you want me to do what? And yet... It's like, okay, take the next step and take the next step and take the next step. And doors opened and things shifted and things changed. And I I found that place in me that really wanted to speak. I found that place in me that really loves the microphone. I know that's not a surprise, right? I found that place in me that was a whole new level of consciousness. So I went to seminary and I I did my ministries and I did 10 years in ministry. And then I was in a ministry in Austin, Texas, actually. And I got a call. Not exactly for me like a phone ringing, but it's a call. It's, you know, in the core of my being. And God said, it's time to leave ministry. And I said, you want me to do what? It's my life, it's my career, it's the only thing I know. These people depend on me. I could never, ever, you know, what we do, right? And so I, but I listened. And, and, and in that moment, I stepped onto a spiritual journey. I know I've spoken into it a couple of times before, but that totally transformed me yet again. But in that moment, I was asked, that moment being, you know, over a period of time. But in that moment, I was asked to let go of everything. I was asked to let go of everything. I remember hearing those words from a man I was studying with at the time. He goes, you'll be asked to surrender everything. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay. 
Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Sounds good on paper. And I was asked, I ended up leaving my ministry. I thought I was leaving the unity movement. I definitely left my career. I had to leave. It looked like Rob and I were like, we were all done. It looked like that had to go away. It looked like everything went away. And I ended up in my car, basically, not homeless in my car, but in my car without a home for a year and a half. Like all my stuff, like all my attachments. But what was really happening inside of me is I had to let go of everything I believed. Everything I believed. I had to let go of all of my beliefs. And I had to let go of all the stuff that ran me and kept me limited and small. I had to let go of my anger. Well, you don't just let go of anger, right? You get to walk through it. You get to deepen your faith. You get to walk up to the altar to sacrifice your son, those things that are most important to you. You get to work them. You get to work them hard. I worked them hard and hard and hard. And then a couple of years goes by and I get another call from spirit and spirit says, okay, it's time. I'm like, okay, for what? And spirit goes, it's time to go to unity of Dallas. And I said, you want me to do what? And yet here we are, right? Here we are, over, well over a year in, and we're being called. We're continually being called to shift and change and grow and step out. We're continually being called to deepen our spiritual, our spirituality, our spiritual journey, our path, our understanding, our connection to God. We're being continually called to put God first in our daily practice, in our lives, in our ministry, and in our world. Could we use a little more God in our world? Oh, yeah. So we have a practice. Okay, so here's a practice. You all have a little piece of paper, and it says, you want me to do what? Have I done that enough? Okay. Well, a couple more times. A couple more times. Well, I won't do it next week, I promise. So here's, so here's some opportunities. And before you, don't jump ahead. Don't guess what I'm going to ask you to do. Don't do that. Stay with me. So we have the opportunity to really look at doing some rebranding at Unity of Dallas. So here's a thought. Um, and the thought will lead to a question. And the question will be, the answer to the question will be what you get to write down. If you do not have a little slip of paper, put your hand up. We have ushers who will bring them to you. So if, er, if you, everybody has a piece of paper, if you don't, just keep your hand up. They're in the back. They're looking for your hands. So here's, so here's a thought process. Our fall is dedicated to we are community with a capital U in community. We are community. We're looking at how can we really take what we have and build it deeper and build it broader and build it in the next way of being. So the thought, and it's not a done deal yet, okay, so take a breath. But the thought is that if we could combine some of the things that we're doing here and offer some different offerings, what might that look like? So here's one of the thought processes. Right now, we have a 9 o'clock service that has about mm, 20 or 25 people in it. And then we have our 11 o'clock service with our full band and our full music and all of that. The thought is that what if we took our 9 o'clock and re-venued it, reworked it, changed the tone of it a little bit. So we thought, what if we did spiritual discovery hour? And still had some music and still had some prayer and still had uh, maybe more prayer and, and then more of a deeper teaching where we have the opportunity to go a little bit deeper into whatever it is that we're teaching about, where, where people really have the opportunity in in group to study these principles. It could even be a little bit interactive. It could be all kinds of different things. So lots of stuff's floating around. But that's not the question. The question is, if we were to rebrand and do something like spiritual discovery hour at nine o'clock, and then we had our celebration service, we could brand our whole morning. So you could come at nine for discovery and stay for celebration service. Here's your question. Would it be better to have our single branded Sunday morning, our celebration service start at 1030 or 11? I'll give you some rationale for 1030, but this is what we're asking you. Rationale at 1030, number one, first and foremost, is you'd be out before the Cowboy game. I mean, we're in the, we're, I mean, we're coming into football season, right? Uh, we actually see people leaving before church is over. We think maybe they're going to, uh, maybe they didn't like to talk, but 
we think maybe they're going to lunch or maybe they don't want the offering basket or, you know, who knows what. But, but then, you know, so we'd all be earlier. So nobody would have to leave early, right? We could combine. We'd have a single Sunday morning. You could go deep and then celebrate. You could do both and. And I keep forgetting the third thing that we're talking about. Oh, yeah, lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get out of here before the noon churches get out so you can get your easy table. I mean, the real, I mean, seriously though, right? So the question is, if we were to do this, would you have a preference? And we're asking you because we want to know. We're asking your thoughts on that. So feel into the possibility. We get that for some of you, 11 o'clock, it's hard to get here by 11 anyway. So it would be like 30 minutes earlier. Of course, if you came at 11, you, you know, you'd still get part of the service. But, um, but really looking at what's in the greater interest of the bigger movement that is called Unity of Dallas. Um, one of the things that we're aware of is churches, most churches that we know of that do a single service have it at 1030. So that's a, that it sounds like an odd time when it's new to us, but, but it's actually a common time. So I want you to breathe, take a breath. I want you to put that thought aside for a moment. We're going to ask you to fill that out before you leave with the simple number 1030 or the simple number 11. If you want to write a comment, you can. But we just want to know 1030 or 11 just to get a feel for where you are. And then we'll have a basket after church is over that you can drop those in and we'll be taking a look at that. Okay, enough of that. So back to your own challenge, your challenge. What is it that God's calling you to do and be? What do you do with that? Quick, quick steps. You take a breath, take a breath, (sighs) right? How are you going to stand it? You make a choice. Are you going to be aware that you have a life challenge and, and your life challenge is getting you down? Or are you going to choose to know that God is calling you to something greater? That God is calling you to walk through a fire? That God is calling you to a deeper spiritual practice? That God is calling you to reframe your opportunity? If we know and believe that there's only one presence and one power, we call it God. And God is good all the time and that we are here to spiritually awaken. That means that each and every opportunity and challenge that we have can be used for that greater good. Reframe it. Listen. Listen deeply with the core of your being. Surrender your resistance to it and take that step. Take that step of trust and build your faith muscles and just simply go for it. Just simply go for it. You might as well. You got nothing to lose, really, really. And you might find that presence and power that's even deeper, that is God in you.